Hey, Travis, you're from Ellerbee, North Carolina originally, is that correct? That is correct. All right. Well, how did you wind up going to work for LG DeWitt? The truth is that at the time his crew chief was a guy named John Hill. I dated John's stepdaughter. So I knew John pretty good. Of course, living in a community like Ellerbee, you knew people anyway. Yeah. And we had kind of family association through the years with Mr. DeWitt. Not directly, but we knew him and a couple of my brothers during their off season, you know, we were farmers basically and they would drive trucks during the winter for Mr. DeWitt. So it was kind of, we kind of, it's just kind of a hometown, close knit group. And, and John, one day I was going to school, I decided to go to school at uh, Old Southern Pines, that community college. I went to, I went, actually went to Banner Elk to Lee's McCray for 10 days. <laughs> I said, I am not, I don't like these mountains, I am not staying up here. And I got on a bus, went back to Rockingham. So I was going to school some, and then John said, well, why don't you come up here and help us a little bit? And I always tell this story, and it's true. I, I worked on a farm, so you work on equipment occasionally. But basically, I didn't know a box in from an open end wrench when I started. Wow. So John, I went in there and worked with John. You know, you work with two or three people, and I just kind of, started learning and got, and got accustomed to doing that. And I said, gee, you know, I think I'd rather do this than something else. So I went to school for about a year, a little over a year, and I quit. And by then things had started to change in the organization or the team. And uh, it's kind of, at one point, it was just Benny Parsons and myself working. No kidding. Yeah, we ran a few races. And then, of course, the team started to grow back a little bit after that. Well, speaking of Benny, he was very early in his career at that stage. So what was your impression of Benny at that time? Well, being a little kid that I was, 20 years old or whatever, I thought, you know, he was kind of like a father figure yeah. to me. And we had a close, rate, close relationship. I was just thinking last night, like what, at Rockingham and places, he would come by to pick me up on the way to work because I lived between where he lived in Ellerby and the track. And about, about seven or eight miles from the track where I was raised. And he'd come and my mother would fix, fix breakfast. And we'd sit and eat breakfast before we go to the racetrack together. So, you know, it's kind of like, but of course he wasn't, at the time you're thinking, this guy's an old man and he's probably 10 years older than I was is all he really was. But very little age difference. What kind of personality did he have? He had he a great, you know, Benny had a great yeah. personality. You guys know him, you know, yeah. he was kind of beloved by the fan just for his his, his sense of humor and, and all that. And he, and he turned out, Benny Parsons was a good race car driver. The problem with somebody like myself, being young, you don't know anything and you don't, when you go to the racetrack, if you're not running good, you don't understand. It's not that you blame the driver, but you say, gee, you know, we just, we just not real good and we need to be better. And you don't really have an appreciation or know how good a guy you're associated with sometimes. But later, later on, as he got better equipment under him and better personnel around him, you know, he proved a worthwhile driver, I think. Tell me about Mr. DeWitt. Uh, with everything that he had going on, I think he was involved in Rockingham at that time. He had the trucking company, had the race uh, team. Got involved in Atlanta also. Yeah, got involved in Atlanta. How involved was he with the race team day to day? Pretty direct. He'd was come, he? He'd come driving that old Mercury around and might blow the horn or something. You'd walk out and he might get out and come inside. You, you just never knew. He, I mean, he just might show up. And uh, <laughs> he was, he was, Mr. DeWitt was a, a hard driven, self made man that I had a great admiration and respect for. I remember he was traveling to the speedway from near where I lived, there was a dirt road. And it was about three or four mile stretch of dirt road. And if you happened to be on that dirt road and Mr. DeWitt was on the way to or from that racetrack, <laughs> I mean, when he came out with those curves, dirt spraying, <laughs> he's running about 70 miles an hour because he's always in a hurry. Yeah, he had so yeah. much to do, he just yeah. stayed in a hurry all the time. But he was quite a remarkable man. In 1973 at Bristol, Benny starts the car, but then turns it over to John Utzman. What do you remember about that? Well, it's a good thing I was raised on a farm and spent all my time outside in the heat. Because <laughs> it was hot. Yeah. I remember we had to race at Daytona. I think, I believe that race might have been on Thursday. I mean, you got like three or four days between races. but. I remember John and somehow John, Benny was, became friends with John, John A. And, and I, of course, he's a very likable guy. And uh, 
we kind of Benny's kind of suspected he wouldn't be able to run that whole race. He, he his neck was kind of weak or had issues with his neck muscles and stuff, and that that particular type of race was really hard on him. So they, we made arrangements. John had practiced a little bit, and it just turned out it was just like all you had to do is run 500 laps to win, because you know. Kale had trouble, and Bobby Allison had trouble, and everybody had trouble, and it was just a matter of surviving, and we were able to do that, and it was, and people look back on the year, and it's sad to say that some people still say, well, he won the championship and didn't win a race, but just just confirm that. How early on in the race did, did John take over? It was probably beyond halfway. I, I, I don't remember particularly about that. I do remember it was he was so far ahead that John, came on the radio and, and he obviously if the car was going to finish it was going to win and John felt it was appropriate for Benny to get back in the car yeah. to be in the car at the end of the race to get the checkered flag. Now did Benny get back in? He did. Okay. Yes, All yes, right. yes, yes. Okay. All right. So I think that was in July uh, it was. at, yeah, at yeah. Bristol. At what yeah. point did... But July the 7th or 8th. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At what point did you feel like the championship was, was a possibility? Oh, you didn't. We didn't think about that till late in the fall. Did you not? Why not? Well, you just you couldn't beat those guys, Rick. I mean, right. you, okay. you, you know, you're a fourth, occasionally third, fourth, yeah. fifth, sixth place finisher. You had the the K and K car, Junior's car, the Wood Brothers when they were in the race. Bud Moore was pretty competitive at times. And who am I missing, Steve? Uh, I think that's about the those were the <laughs> Petties, yeah. of course. The Petties, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Richard. <laughs> but, uh, you, Richard, you know, who? <laughs> those were the guys that uh, you, you know that you knew you had to they you, they had to take advantage of their misfortune, or you just weren't going to outrun them. Right. We just d didn't. Tell me about rocking them. Have, what do you remember about the crash itself that Benny got into? Anything can go wrong, will go wrong. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing that I think is unique about that, and you know, this story has been told many times, obviously, but uh, we were extremely prepared to deal with a, 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 an emergency situation. I mean, we had welding equipment, cutting equipment, uh, people to work. I mean, we were prepared to, to make a major rebuild, which obviously we did in quite, to quite a degree. But what's unique is we didn't have the he <laughs> ripped the right side door bars out of it. And we didn't have anything to replace that with. And a guy named Bobby Muss Grove. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, yeah. Had not made the race. I get, people get it confused with Grave, but it must grow. Grove. Grove, yeah. And Ralph Moody was helping Bobby. But for some reason, it's, it's strange how your car on Sunday was still sitting there after not making a race on Saturday. It was just parked down in the sand. <laughs> so Ralph Moody goes and cranks it up and drives it up to where we're working. He said, cut the bars out of this car. <laughs> and, and people, you know, we had we had good fabricators, Tech Powell on the bars, Rich, Richie and uh, Les Bars and uh, Jimmy Kowalczyk and those guys that were, who, who had actually built the, the cars that we were racing. They had been petty employees and they came and kind of went out on their own and they, they built some cars for, for us at Mr. Twits. So they were doing that major repairs and I was involved with getting the suspension stuff repaired or replaced. But they cut those bars out and welded them in and Joe Gasway asked Benny, he said, do you feel this car safe enough for you to drive it? And he said, yeah. So he went back on the racetrack and finished what we had to do to get it done. And then of course Richard had trouble. I mean, we were hadn't been in the garage long here. He comes in with an engine failure and I think they, we're going to make an attempt to change the engine. And, and when they saw us doing the work we were doing, I think Maurice just threw his hands up and said this, because it was a big old deal to change those big old Hemi engines back in those days. And uh, so, and then Kale, uh, Kale, I think, finished the race, but he just was too far behind to, to, yeah. to overcome it. Yeah. What did it mean to you? I've always heard that members of other teams came in and helped pitch in and all that. As I recall, they could have did as much as they could. The only thing about it, you know, you can only have so many people involved. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're cutting and well, and you know, you got to concentrate and you got to give room, guys room to work and all that stuff. But I think people, you know, it's human nature to pull for an underdog and people knowing that it was Mr. DeWitt's racetrack and it's his team and it's hometown and all those factors, I think, come to play with people. and. 
But, but I think one important ingredient that people lose sight of over the years, I certainly have not. I don't know what it's like in that business today. I've not been in a cup garage since 2003. Wow. But I think the atmosphere is totally different than it was in those days. People, they, they were more camaraderie. Yeah, you had competitive racing on the racetrack, but you were friendly to people. You talked to people. You didn't go around with your nose stuck up in the air like you were special, somebody special. You were just all kind of in it together. And I think that's a big difference in the, Here you the are. environment of you that are 100% world. You're 100% right. Just a big difference in that world and today's world, apparently. Again, I don't know because I haven't been there in almost 20 years. So I don't see it firsthand, but I, I started to see the comings of it when yeah. I was still in it. Because yeah. some of these young guys, and you know, I don't want to be disrespectful, but some of these young drivers, you'd meet them week after week. They'd walk by, you speak to them, they never even looked. They just kept going straight. Yeah. And I thought, well, okay. <laughs> You be what you want to be. Yeah, yeah. What did it mean to you personally to win that Winston Cup? Personally? Well, just for a 23-year-old guy, that, I mean, it's just like... That's what's supposed you, to happen. You, you, <laughs> like, this, is, this is kind of special. <laughs> you know, it's just... Uh, well, I, I felt good for the team. Because, you know, those guys volunteered people. Some of the guys, were, one of them was Mr. DeWitt's nephew, who runs all of the farmer's operations. He had other guys that did other jobs, and they just volunteered as pit crew members. and. So it was special to, to those people, very special for me to see them enjoy that. We talked to Waddell Wilson a year or so ago, and he said that Benny and LG went to Bill France before the start of the 75 season to borrow money to run on. Was that typical of those times, or was there maybe something going on that maybe the team just needed to help? I, that's possible, I, and I did not know that. Okay. All right. All right. I did not know that. Yeah. Well, Waddell also said that Benny blew an engine pretty early on in the 75 Daytona 500. And you won the race with one you pieced together from junk engines or the Waddell did for you. Do you remember anything about that? Well, he, he, it probably was one that he pieced together because he did that. He was involved with supplying engines. And I think he was actually, again, working for Ralph Moody at the time. Ralph, Ralph had separated with John Holman and Ralph had an engine business. And I think Waddell was working for them. Best I recall. Yeah. So you had won the Daytona 500 and the championship pretty early in your career, and you were 23. No, I was 23, I think. Yeah. I was born yeah. 49. So. Yeah. So you you were in your mid 20s. Were you able to appreciate that kind of success that early on, or did that maybe come with time? I don't know if it really registered with me, you know. Yeah. I just yeah. the, the thing about me that I think people don't know is I was never satisfied that that, that we were doing well enough, or I personally was doing well enough. You know, it's it's interesting and moving beyond your question. Probably I know when I, Roger Penske and uh, actually Mark Donahue came and talked to me about moving to Pennsylvania, and then when he died, Roger people pursued it to move up there in 1976 the end of 75 season. I, I remember telling Mr. DeWitt and, and Benny, I said, you know, I'm a pretty young, inexperienced guy, and this will give you an opportunity to get some more experienced, maybe better people on your race team. And that's actually how I felt about it. And I was really proud to be, that Roger asked me to come there, and I still say I might have been the only guy to ever move from the south. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great experience for me, actually. But bottom line is it did give, you know, Jake Elder went there, I think Waddell eventually moved there and they built engines in house for a while and they improved the race team. How difficult was to leave LB? And then where was the Penske team based? Reading, Pennsylvania. Okay. I mean, I, I've lived in Elder my whole life in Richmond County. I mean, it was, but let, let me tell you something. You're young, I'd only been married a year or so. And Roger, he had a whole different philosophy about how to deal with things and treat people and stuff. And, I, and, I, it, and not in a negative way to anyone else, but I thought it was a great opportunity. I said, this, I can learn from this guy. And I just jumped on it and went after it. How much of a difference was there in working for Roger Pansky and LG DeWitt? Well, <laughs> best description. I remember, this, is, this might have been the first race we went to in Riverside, California. You know, I would just fall under and work or whatever. And if you had a creeper over there, I might use her, I might not. And I remember Roger. 
telling me I need to go change clothes because my clothes are dirty. <laughs> but that's wow. that. that yeah, but yeah, but yeah. let me tell you yeah. something. That's that man's mo. I mean, he's he he looks professional. He is professional. He runs everything he does in a professional manner. And always has. And I had a great respect for that. I remember him telling me two or three things that were so important. We drove first time I ever went to New York City. We got in a Cadillac with him. He and I and drove from Reading, Pennsylvania to New York City. And him telling me two or three things that were important. He said, uh, first of all, always look like a winner, regardless how good you can be. Give yourself the best presentation possible. And he said the other the thing, that he, the three things he told me, two I remember specifically. And he said the second was, don't ever use your money if you can use somebody else's. <laughs> Yeah, but for a little twenty-four or five-year-old guy, I mean, you, you absorb these things, guys. Right. You know, you, yeah. it's not like it's just a fleeting thing. You, you kind of, you knew, you knew he's the kind of guy that's going somewhere. You know, and Mr. Dewitt, not that he wasn't going somewhere, but he was an older guy. He had his trucking business, the, the farming business, and all that, and that's where he was going to be. Roger Penske's it, it hadn't scratched the surface yet, and, and I knew that when I was involved with him. I think he did okay. Yeah, he ain't done too bad. <laughs> well, you worked with Bobby Allison in 76. Then you left at the end of the year. What, what happened? I, I, well, the, the, the quick story. Huh. We did work in 76. We had a lot of issues. Uh, we ran pretty good, could not win a race. And at the end of the year, Bobby was upset about the whole situation. And the last race in Ontario, something happened to the engine, some issue, engine issue, or something. He was out of the race. He and Roger got kind of in an, an argument. Bobby got on a bicycle, rode out in the infield, and told Roger he was not coming back. So Roger hired Dave Marcus to drive some, and he ran about ten races. All we ran the next year, and I stayed on with him through through '77. But in defense of the whole thing, I got to tell this story if you don't mind. Great. Absolutely. They were building an engine in house, so they started using this engine plate, which basically bolts on the from the engine block and then the water pump bolts on the outside of that engine plate. So the plate sits between the water pump and the engine block. And a Ford porch from the heads into the water pump are kind of kind of a weird shape. It's hard to describe it. So when they made that the motor plates, they the guy doing it just bored a round hole. So he had a round hole that really didn't match the shape of that port. So we go through the entire year and start out running good and Bobby would complain every week the, that the car would get weaker and weaker as the race went on and the water temperature kept would creep up. And you just, we did radiator changes, we did multiple changes. And the guy that's doing the work was named John, named Woody Woodard. Good guy. He had been a crew chief the year before, but before I came. But he was running, doing the engines. He and a guy named Carl Key Kiefer. No, Carl Key. That's not the right name. It's something like that. He was a, an older guy, very good engine man. But anyway, at the end of the year, I think Woody was having a conversation with Leonard Wood, explaining all the troubles we'd had through the entire year with those engines. And Leonard asked him. He said, "Well, when you board the water passage through that." motor plate, did you bore a round hole or did you match the port shape? And that was the problem the entire year. It had a whole different year. Yeah. But then you got to throw in the two accidents. He had a really bad accident in Rockingham and up in, like in I think in Brainerd, Minnesota. He had a really, really bad crash in a modified type car or something. Right. I remember that. How, how did you wind up with Junior? Well, I had to do something, so Roger was done. He, he wasn't going to run stock cars anymore, so I don't know. I guess Junior maybe called me or something. I don't remember how that happened. Got lucky, though. Fortunate, lucky, blessed, whatever you call it. But, I, I mean, through my whole the years I spent doing it, I mean, I I had a lot of good things come my way and gave me a, good, a lot of good opportunities a lot of people didn't get. Right. Other people could do it as good or better than I did, and they just didn't get the opportunities. Well, you and Tim Brewer. Both of us yeah, kind of like co-crew chiefs, he called Yeah, how that relationship we did, out. we did well. Huh. We actually did well. well the I'm going to tell you something. I'm not a controversial guy. People yeah. always see me kind of a gloomy, <laughs> mad look, but I'm not a controversial yeah, person. Yeah, I never yeah. have been. Yeah. 
the championship that year wasn't even close. I think it was. I, I think you were more than 400 points yeah. ahead at the end of the year. What made you guys so good in '78? Well, they had a good. I mean, they were in good shape the previous two years. They right. won the championship, so all we had to do was continue what they were doing. And of course, we <laughs> we built cars that. You know, you probably you couldn't get through inspection today, obviously. But, uh, so you had to oh, look, really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't it wasn't anything illegal, yeah. but it, but just took advantage of a lot of things, and we had really good cars. And, and Kale was a heck of a race driver. I'm tell you that. I mean, if you got him, he'd always say, "Just get me close, and I'll do the rest." And he would, he could do it. Just how tough a race car driver was Kale Yarbrough? From just the, to, for, and from my opinion. There was nobody more determined and could push himself any further than Kale could. I mean, all of them were good. Harry was good. Bobby was great. I mean, all of those guys were good. But Jill, Kale just, I mean, that little rascal, he just had a determination that was beyond belief, I think, for me. Tell us, tell us something we don't know about the 1979 Daytona 500. <laughs> I don't know what you might not know, but I'll just kind of revisit it because I do remember it. I, I want to make this comment. There are probably three races that I'm the most disappointed about in my racing career. One people don't remember anything about was a 1975 Southern 500. Okay. Benny started that race. We had a really, really good car. And a car that could win the race. But he, he said, man, I am sick. He said, you got to get somebody to drive. Well, Daryl had not been driving long, so he so he'd had trouble or something. So we go get Daryl to drive this car. And he's running, and I said, boy, all we got to do is run 500 miles and we win this race. Lo and behold, he's flying along there, you know, out running everybody. Next thing you know, in the wall in the third turn. That impatient youth, he just, you know how, you'd have to be really cautious sometime and then and, and wait for the right spot and let somebody in. He didn't do it and crashed that thing. Especially at Darlington. And, and, and didn't win that race, and that was really disappointing. The 85 Southern 500 was a real disappointment. When Bill won a million dollars, I mean, we had him beat. We had, to, we had one year before, we, we, we could win that race. And I think he, Anyway, it broke a vow, but I think he old revved it on the restart. But that's just here to there. Anyway, we fell out of the race, and I was really disappointed that. Everybody was happy to see Bill win that money. It's like, Bill, we want to beat you, but we want you to win the money. <laughs> you know, that kind of, that kind yeah, of feeling. That's yeah. how people yeah, felt yeah, those yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. Even Hal Needham said, you know, he said, I'm sorry we had trouble, but I'm glad we had trouble, because I'm glad we Bill won that money. But I was disappointed about that, and then the Daytona 579. Uh, it, it kind of wet when the race started. The track was still a little bit down. And David and Donnie and Kale, I think, all spun out about the fourth lap. Mm -hmm. So when they get done and get sorted out and get running again, at one point, Kale was the slowest car on the racetrack. People don't remember that. And we kept, it had misaligned the front end so bad. So we raised the hood and, and Brewer would, you know, those things had strut rods managing the floor A-frames and everything, to adjust the caster and, you know, the kingpin inclination and all that. Do a lot of it with the strut rod. So Brewer would pull on the strut rod. I would get where I could sight from the top to the bottom ball joint, you know, to see the distance. Because if you get a little bit of pitch, it's what you want. Get some caster in it so it won't wander around so bad. So we kept adjusting those strut rods and messing with the toe in. And we lost three laps. And he came back and made them all up. <laughs> and then, was you know, and it's... Of course, you know the end of the result. That the end, we, we thought we had. Of course, you never, you know, you never won anything until it's over. But we knew you had a good shot. And then, of course, it came down to what it did, and it was just a big disappointment. Just point of thing, personally, do you remember how Junior looked or reacted when he heard all that over the radio? Probably like he always did about everything. No emotion. I don't think he threw the stuff. I don't think he probably just turned away. And, and I don't remember seeing it because we all just had such a devastating. Yeah. Uh, reaction to it, but uh, such a disappointment because we had worked so hard. You had a decent season in 1979. You won, I think, four races, but you did fall to fourth in the final standings. Um, was that just one of those racing deals, or was it just time for somebody else to win the championship? That, Rick, maybe it's just time for somebody else. You know, we, we it seemed like if we could find a way to stump our toe, we'd, we'd go out and do it. 
And actually, we did it in 1982. Yeah. We, I mean, we lost it. I don't know the final result in, in, in 1980. I thought it was 18 points, but it might have been different than it that. It was close. It, it came down to the, to the, the last, last race, race of the year. And, yeah. we, and we, we fumbled and, and messed that up. And we, but we look back and we, I see races, you know, where we had some issues we shouldn't have had that would have won that championship. So you just, you just have to don't make mistakes. Yeah. 19, 1980, uh, Kale decides at some point during the year that he's going to move on the next year, doesn't want to run a full schedule. And evidently, Junior wasn't too happy about that. Do you remember anything I remember about Junior it? sitting down and talking to me about it, but he didn't, I mean, I don't know, that he, I think he was disappointed, but you know, Junior was a guy that, he had a strong organization, and I always saw Junior as a guy that, and one thing that I tell people I learned from Junior Johnson, I learned how to win. I mean, he's a guy that that never thought he could be beaten, or would was he was never beaten until the last lap was run. And he was a guy that would always find a way. And Junior always had an ability, in my opinion, to attract some of the better drivers. Yeah. And he and I just thought, well, he'll, he'll get him a good driver. He always has. When did you first hear from Hal Needham? I get a call from Humpy Wheeler. And called me at Junior's shop, as a matter of fact. And it tells me a little bit about Hal Needham and asked me if I'm interested in coming talking. And I said, yes, I would like to do that. So I sat down and told Junior that he had called me, that I wanted to go talk. Because I had a great respect for Junior. We got along extremely well. And I didn't want to do something behind his back. And so and that's how it developed. And I told Junior I was going to talk to him. And we went and sat down and talked to him. And there was a guy involved with him, uh, uh, Johnny Hayes. Y'all know who Johnny Hayes was. And Johnny Hayes is in there because he was kind of got associated with Hal and Stan Barrett some kind of way. And Johnny, I'm never really going to forget this. Johnny and I were friends later, and our wives are still good friends. You know, John's been dead for several years, but Ann and Linda are still good friends. But Johnny looks at me and said, well, they, they want an answer now. I looked him straight in the eye and said, I told you, I'm not giving you an answer now. I'm giving you an answer after I go sit down and talk to Junior Johnson, the man who I work for. So... Johnny got a taste of what Travis could be like. <laughs> but I was serious about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. what did Junior say to you when he told you? He said, you can't, he said, you, it's an opportunity you need to take. Well, it was twice the money I was making, you know, first of all. And, you know, a young guy, I mean, money tracks people, guys, you know that. Oh, yeah. And it's not, but, and he had a good organization. He could get good people. He wasn't going to miss me. So, and plus, then, then Junior always, there's always opportunity. He said, well, where are you going to get the engine? <laughs> and I said, well, we've got to work on it. He said, maybe I said, let me build engines for you. So that's kind of how it was. It's almost like a two Junior Johnson cars yeah, active yeah. for a while. 